Hello, everyone. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, uh, I am Tara Gopinath, and I'm here to talk on Linux virtualization-based security. I work at Microsoft, and for the last two years, I've been leading this team of very smart engineers who are trying to prototype, productize, uh, develop this solution. And with me, I have Anna, and I'll let Anna introduce herself. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is uh, Anna Trikalinu. I've been with Microsoft for about two years working on the thing that we're going to present today. Uh -huh. um, and before that, I was with Intel for about seven years working on confidential computing, um, side channels, and so on. OK, so let's get started. So this is what we have in agenda today. We'll start with an introduction and a brief motivation on why we decided to pursue this project. And then we go into a bit of background on Hyper-V as the hypervisor. Uh, we talk about the threat model in Linux virtualization-based security. Uh, and then we look briefly look at how this all ties in with Secure Boot. And then we go on and explore the two initial features that we wanted to target with the solution. One is protecting the guest memory, and other one is protecting guest registers, or kernel registers. Finally, we have a demo, and then we conclude with what, and we talk a bit on what we want to do next. So let's start with the motivation. So when we started this, what the thought process behind this was, like Linux kernel is growing, and, and as it grows, there are more and more vulnerabilities introduced into it. Every month or every other month, we hear about exploits and threats and things like that. So our goal here is to actually harden the existing kernel protections and back it up using hypervisor so that even if a kernel is tampered with, even if there is a malicious attacker that has gained entry into the kernel, um, these protections cannot be turned off. And as an extension of this goal, we also want to ensure that some of the key system assets, like let's say keys, passwords, critical kernel data structures, uh, they remain untampered even if there is a malicious attacker in the kernel. And then, OK, so this solution is called Linux virtualization-based security. It is derived and inspired from Windows VBS. Windows has this virtualization-based security running for a while now. And the basic premise here is what we use hypervisor and hardware, hardware virtualization support to protect kernel. We say guest OS because primarily we are, we lo we are been looking at guest kernels to start with, but, but theoretically it can be even the host kernel. And one of the basic principles behind our architecture is we want this to be an open source architecture. What that means is we want it to be hardware agnostic. Currently, we have the solution working with both AMD and Intel x64 architecture. Uh, we want this to be hypervisor agnostic. We again have this working with our parts of this working with Hyper-V and KVM. Uh, I have Mikhail here, so he is working on the KVM part of things, and he has already posted uh, some RFC patches under the umbrella of hypervisor enforced kernel integrity HECI. And this presentation itself will focus on the Hyper-V implementation. And even the Hyper-V parts of things that we want to introduce into Linux kernel and the secure OS that you will hear about in a minute, we are looking at upstreaming all that support. And we have already have the code out there in the GitHub repo. So now, we, as we get into architecture, let's quickly look at how a Hyper-V-based system looks like today without any uh, support for LVBS. There is hardware, there is Hyper-V running at ring minus one, and then the system itself can be partitioned. There is a root partition and multiple guest partitions. And there is kernel running at ring zero in each of these partitions, and there is user space at ring three. And for LVBS, we use a Hyper-V mechanism or Hyper-V feature known as virtual secure mode, VSM. And with, once we turn on VSM, this is how the system looks like. Again, there is hardware. There is Hyper-V running at ring one. System is partitioned into root and multiple guest partitions. And each of these partitions, now we have separate execution environments. They are called virtual trust levels. Theoretically, each of these partitions can be subdivided into 16 VTLs. Hyper-V has support for it, uh, but the, for the purpose of the stock and for the purpose of LVBS, we only have two. There is VTL 0, 
where the regular guest OS runs, and then there is VTL1, which is where we want to introduce a secure OS in order to provide the protections that we want with LVBS. Also to be noted is the fact that higher is the VTL, more privilege the VTL has, which means VTL0 or the guest OS will have the least privilege in the system. We'll quickly look at a few VSM features. We can't go into details of all this, so there is a link there if someone is interested to read more on what VSM is. So one of the basic features, it offers virtual processor state isolation, which means it allows each of the VTL to define its own set of CPU register and have its own virtual processor context. Also, it allows for memory hierarchy and protection, memory access hierarchy and protection, which means that each VTL can have its own guest physical memory access protections, but also a higher VTL can impose memory restrictions on a lower VTL. For example, if I have VTL zero that goes in and says a piece of memory should be read-write, and I have VTL one that goes and says that the same piece of memory can only be read-only, the permission or the protection that is set by VTL1 takes precedence here. And finally, it allows for virtual interrupt and intercept handling. Each VTL has its own interrupt subsystem, and always a higher VTL takes precedence over a lower VTL. If there is an event in a higher VTL, Hyper-V enforces that the CPU is switched over to the higher VTL, which means that a higher VTL can process the interrupts without interference from the lower VTL and the jump back has always to be initiated by the higher VTL. So now we look at the software architecture. Again, there is hardware and Hyper-V, and this is a guest partition that we are looking at. It is divided into VTL0 and VTL1. Uh, VTL0 has guest kernel and the user space running, and inside the guest kernel, we have a VSM boot driver that loads everything in VTL1, and we talk about that a bit more on why we decided to do that. And then there is a bunch of hypervisor agnostic layers with, for memory protection and exception handler, handling and things like that. Uh, and this is how we, and more, or we are building, building this to ensure that the solution is hypervisor agnostic. And then there is VSM driver itself, which kind of takes the request from this hypervisor agnostic layer and passes it on to VTL1. On the VTL1, there is a very minimal bootloader running in the, in the kernel mode, which kind of allows you to load the secure kernel. And in the secure kernel, which is a minimal Linux kernel today, uh, there is an inter interrupt and intercept handler, um, there is a VSM driver and a memory protection interface, and there can be a user interface which can be extended to enable trustless and secure apps, but that is not implemented today. So a quick look, so this, we want this to be a self-contained solution, and I said, I talked about the VSM boot driver, which loads the secure OS in VTL1, uh, and the reason is we did have a lot of design discussions on which component should launch and set up VTL1 secure kernel. Uh, the options we had here were one was hypervisor, which would mean that we tightly couple this, which it kind of becomes the hypervisor and kernel becomes coupled together in this case, and which we didn't want. Uh, the second option was the bootloader itself, which means the UEF, use the UEFI bootloader that loads the guest OS today and ask it to load the secure OS as well, which is probably not scalable as we want to move from one guest OS to the other guest OS. And finally, we landed on the solution where we said that we can trust probably the kernel till the init process, the first user process runs because of secure boot, and we let kernel load the um, OS, secure OS in VTL1. With that, I hand it over to Anna to talk on threat model and the rest of the slides. Okay, so we said that we selected um, the guest kernel to be responsible for booting VTL1. So the guest OS that we are trying to protect is going to be responsible for booting this secure OS to apply protections to it, which kind of doesn't make sense because if the kernel, the guest kernel is malicious, then how do we trust it to boot this secure OS to apply these protections? It will just skip it, right? Well, not exactly. <laughs> so our goal is to protect the kernel from a user space attacker exploiting a kernel vulnerability. 
but we assume that the kernel is benign. We do not start with, uh, with a malicious kernel. We assume that initially the kernel comes from a trusted source, so that can be canonical, for example, and that the integrity of that kernel is verified. So both the authenticity and integrity um, security promises are guaranteed by secure boot. Um, so with that in mind, we can make sure that initially when the guest kernel starts to boot, it's something that we trust. However, we do have the premise that even though this is a trusted kernel initially, this kernel is vulnerable. It can either have an unpatched uh, CVE or it just have a, a zero day that we just don't know of yet. And that's very plausible because there are many uh, new kernel vulnerabilities that come every year. Okay, so we trust the guest kernel initially until the very first uh, unverified user application, user process starts running. And that is the init process for us. So up until this point, the guest kernel starts to boot. It's doing the, um, the initial setup, initializing memory uh, and everything. And this is where we added our functionality. So this is where we verify everything that runs in VTL1. So the secure kernel and the, the mini bootloader that we have. Uh, after this is verified, we, uh, we boot VTL1, we apply the memory protections that are immutable, meaning that if uh, the guest kernel tries to change those protections afterwards, that will fail. We also lock the control registers. And after that, and after all these um, protections have been applied, then we, we do the init process. And after that point, uh, we assume that the kernel um, is not trusted and couldn't be exploited. That could be, for example, because we have an uh, unverified user application just exploiting a kernel vulnerability and then granting kernel privileges to the attacker. Okay, so we semi-trust <laughs> the guest kernel, at least the, the trust is temporal. Um, but we do have full uh, trust in the hypervisor, the host OS, and the hardware. So all of those are inside the DCB. Um, however, even though the uh, R architecture, LVBS architecture, trusts the hypervisor, the, our security goal is orthogonal with and complementary to confidential computing. So our goal with uh, LVBS is to protect the guest kernel from itself, essentially. And the goal with confidential computing is that we want to protect the guest from either malicious hypervisor, malicious host OS, or just an admin, or someone that just walks into the data center and just starts to mess things uh, around. So those are slightly different. And right now our solution does not work with confidential computing, however, it is possible to happen and we actually have it as a future work. Um, so in, in that case, instead of using the hypervisor to apply the memory protections, we are going to use um, the hardware and firmware extensions that are supported as part of new confidential computing hardware. And we're also going to use the paravisor for um, doing the register pinning. Okay, so now let's talk a little bit about secure boot. Um, on the figure that you see um, below, you see up until, uh, like initially, this is how the secure boot wor uh, works. We are just uh, extended that uh, chain of trust. So initially, <coughs> UEFI firmware is the one that is uh, verifying the integrity of the shim. If we have a, a Linux uh, kernel booting, then the shim is the one that is using the uh, canonical key to verify the integrity of the bootloader, such as grub, and verify the integrity of the VTL0 uh, guest kernel. So what we, are, we are, what we did is that we extended that and we are saying that now the uh, guest kernel, before the init process starts, so while the guest kernel is still trusted, it will also verify the integrity of the secure kernel, so everything that runs in VTL1. And um, for that, we used uh, just standard SHA-256 with RSA and PKS7 uh, signature. Um, the, the one slight thing that I guess it's important is that 
okay, what is the key that we are going to use in order to verify VTL1? For our environment, which is a dev environment, we've added one key uh, to the VTL0 um, system trusted keys. So when we are uh, compiling a VTL0 kernel, we, ha we use a config register and we say, okay, this is our, our uh, public key. Please, please use that in order to verify the integrity of VTL1. Um, this is for dev purposes. However, if or when, hopefully, uh, our changes are accepted in mainline, we can just reuse the um, canonical key that is already part of the system trusted key rings. And we can use that canonical key to verify the integrity of VTL1. So the figure will not change. It's just that instead of using that VTL1 purple key, we'll just use the orange one. Um, this is the way that we generated the signatures for uh, the secure kernel and the bootloader binaries. We just used a standard script that is part of the kernel. And then we added the signature files as part of the VTL0 uh, in ethermfs. Um, we added the certificate, as I said, to using that config register. Um, and um, before the, v the VTL1 boots, VSM boot driver uh, reads those uh, signatures and verifies the, that they are um, indeed signed with that, uh, that they are signed with the private key of that, um, of that key pair. Okay, so now we know that what we've loaded in VTL1 is trusted. Um, now let's talk about what is the interface between VTL0 and VTL1. Um, one thing to note is that we want the, the VM to run on VTL0, which is the guest, 99% of the time. We want the guest to run its own workload instead of another, to steal cycles from that VM in order to do those security protections. So that's why we mostly say about transitions from VTL0 to VTL1. And in order to do those transitions, there are three ways to do that. One is an explicit VTL call, which is just a, a special uh, hyper call um, that is done. So, so VTL0 does a VTL call and that set, uh, transitions the VP from VTL0 to VTL1. Um, there are currently uh, four opcodes that we have defined or doing that VTL call. And we use um, two uh, opcodes for booting VTL1, one that enables VTL1 for the secondary processors and the other opcode for booting those secondary processors in VTL1. And then we have two more um, opcodes that are used for applying protections, one to protect memory and the other one to log control registers. So I'm gonna talk about the, those two later on, today, uh, later on in the presentation. Um, the important thing to note here is that um, three out of those four VTL call uh, opcodes can only be done before the init. So we make sure that if there is a VTL call with the three out of the four VTL calls after the init process starts, um, this is, it's, it's not going to do anything. Um, the, the one that we do allow is the protect memory. Um, however, any memory that has been uh, protected prior to the init process, um, it's, the protection is immutable, meaning that if the kernel after the init process starts, so a, a potentially malicious kernel tries to change the protections uh, for, for a piece of memory that has been set with a set of permissions and this is marked as immutable, then the, the latter um, VTL call with protect, with, which would change the permissions will not succeed. Okay, the second way to transition uh, to VTL1 is through secure interrupt. Uh, as we said, as Tara said, the VTL, um, VTLs are hierarchical, meaning that if there is an interrupt pending for a higher VTL, then the VP will transition to that. Um, and one thing is that one main or big source of interrupt is the timers um, that just does 
periodic uh, interrupts. Uh, however, we disable timers in VTL1 uh, while VP is in uh, VTL0, and that is in order to uh, reduce jitter. And thirdly, um, there is the secure intercept. So whenever VTL0 violates one of the protections that VTL1 has set, then the VP uh, that triggered that fault will enter VTL1. Okay, so now let's talk about memory protections. In order to, to do that, we have used uh, the memory protection framework that you saw in the earlier sl slide that is introduced by Hecky. Um, this is the RFC for anyone that um, is interested in that, so I'm, I'm just going to briefly talk about it here, but if you want to know more information, there is a bunch of it. Um, I will highly uh, recommend that you go see this uh, RFC. So as I said, this uh, component is common between Hyper-V and KVM. And what uh, HECI uh, or memory protection does initially is that it allocates uh, permission counters for each 4KB uh, page in the guest. So for example, if the kernel has large pages, then the VTL0 will allocate multiple permissions in order to represent that page. We also need uh, counters instead of just one bit to say if it's read or write, uh, because we can have multiple mappings. So multiple um, guest virtual addresses can map to the same uh, guest physical uh, address. So we want to capture, so the permissions that are um, applied in the EPT is going to be the union of those permissions. So if there is one mapping that says, I want to read that piece of memory, and then there is another page within VTL0 that says, I want to read write this memory, we have to, the EPT permissions need to be the union, so both read and write. Otherwise, we're going to break um, the software. Um, the, the, the permissions are captured as read, write, uh, and then execute is divided into user execute and kernel execute. And in order to do that, we utilize uh, a hardware feature that is called MBEC. Um, and then finally, Hecky will will get a capture of what is the uh, guest page table permissions initially, and then it will track how those permissions change over time. So if you want to map this into our uh, VTL model, this is, we have a figure of how this will look like. So initially VTL0 will allocate and update the, those permissions, and then before the init process starts, VTL0 would do a, a single VTL call that says, here's the memory that I want to protect, here are the permissions that I want, and please make them immutable. VTL1 will receive that request, it will store the memory ranges that are mapped as immutable, and then it will do a hyper call to Hyper-V that says, please apply those permissions in the EPT. Hyper-V will do it, and then um, we will return to VTL1, and then later on in VTL0. Um, and again, all of this happens before uh, the init process starts and while uh, the guest kernel is trusted. This is a look of the permissions that we have set. So the read-only uh, read data section is marked as read-only. The text section, which is where the code um, for the kernel lives, is marked as read and kernel execute. A VTL1 memory is marked as read-only, and everything else is marked as read-write and user-execute. Um, again, this is the view of the memory as uh, from the perspective of the VTL0 uh, guest kernel. And if you want to look at the comparison, the default permissions, so without LVBS, the, the default permissions that um, uh, Hyper the Hyper-V will apply is is everything. So read, write, kernel execute, and user execute. So this is, um, I think, a, a big improvement that we have uh, with LVBS. Um, if after we apply the protections, there is an EPT access violation, then a memory intercept is injected to VTL1, which raises, uh, raises a general protection fault in VTL0. Um, and as I said, if there's a subsequent request for changing permissions, on a region that is already protected and marked as immutable, then that request is ignored and we have future work to add some bookkeeping and maybe report that request, that 
maybe it's suspicious. Um, something is suspicion, uh, suspicious running in guest kernel. Okay, so now let's talk about register pinning. Uh, Hyper-V supports intercepting access to a number of registers, and I have the full list on the right side here. I hope it's legible, but there are quite a few. <laughs> um, and we have divided this set into, uh, divided those uh, registers into two sets. The first set is um, the one that you see on the table on the first row. So any uh, writes to those registers will get blocked and will raise a GP fault in VTL0. The second set, which is the second row in the table, um, any writes to any of um, those registers, we check whether the new value that has been written is the same as the one that was there in pre-init, so while we trusted the guest kernel. Otherwise, the uh, write gets blocked and we raise a GP fault. The reason why we have this uh, second list of registers is that those registers lose their uh, value when, the, let's say, the VM goes into suspend. So when the, the VP loses power and the VM uh, goes into sleep mode, then hypervisor sets those registers to zero. This is emulating what the real hardware would do if that uh, guest was running on um, in bare metal instead of the Hyper-V. So those registers are set to zero and then when the VM comes up, the VM is responsible for setting those values back. So we, we want to allow the writes uh, to those registers, but we want to make sure that they are um, set to the same value as they were when we were trusting the, um, the guest kernel. And here is the flow of uh, doing the register, uh, locking the CRs. Um, VTL0 is responsible for setting the security policy and the mask for VTL0, for um, the control registers. And then for each VP that is present in the uh, guest kernel, we, each VP does a VTL call that says, uh, please uh, lock the registers and here's the mask that I want to apply. VTL1 um, saves the, the register value that was there that is used as the ground truth um, for subsequent um, writes. And then after that, it's doing a hyper call to Hyper-V that says, please lock them. Um, the Hyper-V applies the locks and sets the masks. And then we have, it returns, every VP is returning to VTL0. If there is a subsequent write request to one of those registers that is monitored, then an intercept is injected to VTL1. Okay, so let's, let's talk about a little bit of exception handling. So I just said if there is, um, if the VTL0 tries to access a register that is locked, or if their VTL0 tries to access a memory, a piece of memory that has applied some protections, um, and it's violating the permissions that were set, then an exception is raised. Um, in that case, uh, VTL1 injects a general protection fault to VTL0 and returns the control back to VTL0. Then that VTL0 uh, will cause um, the thread to be killed, and depending on the configuration, uh, it could cause a kernel panic as well. And here is the flow. So assuming that the the attacker, after, so after the init process and when the attacker could be compromised, um, if the attacker tries to write in, let's say, and modify a read-only memory, then the hardware will walk the EPT tables. It will see that the permissions are, do not allow the write, and then it will um, trigger a, a violation in the hypervisor. Uh, the hypervisor will um, cause an intercept in VTL1, which will uh, um, say, oh, this happened, this is not allowed. And then that will inject a, a GP fault in VTL0, which in turn is going to um, kill the thread and panic. And with that, Tara is going to show a pretty cool demo of our technology working. I will try. Let's see if this works. Okay, so I will play the demo and I will talk through it. That's the plan because I don't think the volume will come out pretty well. If 
We just let this run. Mute the volume. Okay, so what we are trying to do here is to show that how uh, how we protect some of the system registers that Anna talked about um, using LVBS. So the demo here is we use the IDTR register for this demo. Uh, it is the intrep descriptor table register and it holds the base address and limit for IDT uh, table. IDT table itself contains information on uh, interrupt handlers and exception handlers and things like that. And it resides in the read-only memory of the kernel. Uh, so the idea here is that even if it is read-only, let's say all the protections are applied and the IDT table is read-only, if a malicious attacker en gains entry into the kernel, uh, they can actually change the base of the IDT in IDTR. They can make the IDTR point to a different IDT with and the, it can be a speed, it, and you can have spurious entries in that IDT. A attacker can do whatever they want to do with that. So, uh, we in, in this demo, well, first we run this on a system without LVBS enabled and see what happens. And where the, and the attack, and we can show that the attack could be successful. And then we run it with LVBS, and we show that LVBS will raise the general protection fault that Anna talked about, and uh, which will eventually lead to the system crash and things like that. Uh, as we play this, is that legible? Okay, I'm assuming so, okay. What happened? Okay, so this is a test. It's a kernel module at this stage. And um, the test itself, the uh, test case itself is quite simple here. What we try to do, I'll skip forward, and what we try to do is, um, we create, we run this on five CPUs in parallel. Um, and before the test, we kind of go, I kind of go and create a new IDT table. I just copy it from the existing IDT table, but it's so that it's in a new location and things like that. And I'm not malicious at this point, so I don't create any spurious entries or anything like that. Uh, and then I spawn this corrupt IDTR test function on uh, five of these, on these five CPUs. And inside this function, what I do is I go and store the current uh, base address, the IDT base address from the uh, IDTR register. Okay, I'm sorry. Let us just talk about it a little bit. Yeah. Um, so we, I store the current IDT base address, and I attempt to load the IDTR with the new IDT base address, and then at the end, I kind of check if the, um, I read back the IDTR register, and then we say that if the current, if there's a change, basically, if there's a new IDT address in the IDTR, which doesn't match with the original uh, IDT address, uh, the hack was successful. Okay, let's run this. And... So yeah, so this is a system without VSM or LVBS enabled. And this is a module, so I am just inserting the module at this point. And it ran through, and let's look at the D message. Okay, I don't know if you can, see. can you see that? Can you see those red lines? Yeah, okay. I don't know. Okay, so what it says is the test ran on five CPUs, CPU 17, 18, 21, 5, and 23, and all of them, this hack was successful, which means that uh, the, I, the base address in IDTR was changed. It was originally X, and now it is Y. I managed to put in, put in my new IDT address in there, and the hack was successful. And now let's go and run this on a system with LVBS enabled. Let's see. Okay, so here I have LVBS enabled, which means you will see prints for saying that, okay, some memory protections have been applied, uh, some of the registers have been successfully locked down, and things like that. And in the system, if, let's try running. And let's try running the test. Yeah. 
It should come up in a second. And there you go. The system actually crashed here. What, what you see on the left is the cr crash dump, basically. So what happened here was, uh, again, the test ran on five uh, random CPUs in the system. Uh, we tried to call up the IDTR register. It got intercepted at VTL1, and VTL1 injected a GP fault in VTL0, um, and VTL0 raised a oops on that, and the system has actually panic on oops set, so which means it went and the system died and it crashed. And that is the end of the demo. And I think we have like one slide and we can talk a little bit on put in the present. future work that we are planning to do with this technology. Um, so one of the things what we want to implement here and which is in progress actually is module authentication where we say that okay we put all these protections in the kernel memory but kernel has a bunch of features which want, which actually wants to change some of these protections, for example, to load modules. There are other features also, like KXEC, F-trace. So we need to tackle all of that, but initially we are tackling module authentication. So the point here is, if we want to change the memory permissions that are set up initially at kernel boot, like Anna talked about, we should authenticate those changes before we allow those permission, new permissions to be set. And for that, the first feature that we are targeting is module authentication. Uh, the other thing we are attempting to do is to uh, extend and implement some secure user interfaces in the secure OS running, in the secure kernel running in VTL1 so that we can support trustlets and secure apps. And finally, like Anna mentioned, we are trying to see and in intersect and integrate this with confidential VMs and confidential computing. With that, the, okay, so this is where we have hosted all the code that we have today, and we are planning to upstream most of this. And that brings us to end of this presentation. I, I also want to mention that yesterday we yes. had a presentation in OSS that we went into a lot more details on how we boot VTL1 which included what does the bootloader does, what does the um, VTL1 does in order to boot both the primary processor and the secondary processors. So if you're interested in that, uh, please check it out. Yeah, it talks a little bit more on how we decided to choose minimal Linux kernel as the secure OS and things like that, so yes. Mm -hmm. Any questions? I'm sure you have been asked this question many times, uh, but you already said that uh, this this work and confidential compute are orthogonal. Mm. But uh, like we saw in the morning presentation, thing about SVSM, right? The kind of functionality that this thing is providing is kind of similar to SVSM as well. Like you know, SVSM also can provide virtual TPM and things like that. And I think one of the functionality that uh, uh, VSM provides is uh, VTPM and these kind of secure functionalities. So don't you think it will be like more beneficial if there is a single model which is serving for confidential compute needs as well and the needs of uh, uh, protecting the guest kernel as well? Yeah, so right now in order to provide, for example, virtual TPM capabilities or um, what we call the the paravisor uh, for, for confidential computing. So it, if the guest is not aware of confidential computing, there is the paravisor that helps to alleviate that pain or um, before all the changes that are implemented in the guest. But now it seems like the paravisor is here to stay. Um, and one of them is uh, because of virtual TPM. So we right now, um, this is running on a different VTL level. Um, there, there has been a lot of discussion whether we should merge it or not. Um, and there are pros and cons in either, in its uh, option that we take. The main uh, case for having them separate is because the paravisor, the, the purpose of the paravisor that is doing this is um, 
is mostly a, a, is seen as an extension of the um, hypervisor that we don't trust. And it's supposed to be OS agnostic, meaning guest OS agnostic, as opposed to this, which is highly coupled with the, the OS that you have in, running in VTL0. So Windows have its own, own very different version of VTL1. Linux will have this version or you know, some uh, version of that. So that was just one um, option towards having them separate. But there are benefits of having them together, I agree. So we'll see. Yeah, yeah we can chat later. I, I will just add on to that, that I have what Anna, whatever Anna said, that for example, there are features that VSM offers, let's say the control register or the register protection, right? That today, if you want to do with either Paravisor or confidential computing, we need hardware, hardware extensions for it. It is, it is available because Hyper-V allows you to intercept and interject and raise those exceptions in case of violations. Hyper-V has that capability today. Whereas those things, if you want to support with CVMs, we need hardware support for it. Right, but SVSM like is running on x86 hardware, right? Or And this is also x86 hardware. It is interacting with the VMM, which is under uh, below it. It is, but it doesn't have support to raise an exception. It doesn't have that support, or someone has to bring, up, bring in that support. And that's my, that was my primary question. Right now, it does not have support. All you have to add is like code to invoke those hyper calls, then it can do that. So I was like hmm. basically thinking that to maintain two different kind of parallel VTLs, one for yeah. confidential compute, one for this, does it hmm. even make sense? I agree. I agree that uh, yeah. they could, look, you can implement it either way. Both of them are going to work. Um, if it's one, then it's it's better because you only have one additional kernel that you have to worry about, right? Yeah, that's <laughs> just a suggestion. It might you know yeah. it might lead to you know better adoption rate as well because you have now two use cases for one piece of software. Yeah. I don't have a strong opinions either way. <laughs> Hello. Uh, first, uh, great work. Uh, I work for Azure, so I'm really excited to see this. Uh, definitely going to look you up and ask questions soon. Uh, question is, uh, do you support uh, kernel modules at all, or is it like a no-go here? Uh, right now, with this, no, but we, we are adding it. So we, we, we are working towards adding it. And okay, cool. Th that is our very next step, basically, to add kernel module support. Okay, also BPF, I assume, same? same uh, no, or BPF no? is lower in that list we okay, <laughs> yeah. want to go. Keep it away. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, the other question I had is like, uh, if you have like two virtual addresses kind of mapping to the same physical page, how does that, is that handled? Like, so you, you have like two different virtual addresses. So I assume you should be using the virtual addresses to, uh, to map the permissions. Mm -hmm. uh, so could you use like a different mapping to that very same page which you block to circumvent the protection? Does so it make sense? So the permissions, we set them at the EPT, so the extended page tables that are handled by the um, hypervisor. Okay. Um, what, we, what I talked about earlier is having uh, two mappings into the same GPA. This is the first level page tables which are handled, which are inside the VM. Okay. So at the end of the day, um, if there is one mapping that says read and the other mapping that says read write in the first level page tables and both are valid, then the EPT, in order to allow both transactions for, let's say, both applications, it has to be the union of it. Okay, so get like the, the most uh, mm. inclusive. Okay, and last question, I, that's me not knowing enough about virtual machines, but uh, does FISMAP is, is a concern? I, I think FISMAP is not available in, in virtual machines, right? A physical mapping of, of doesn't ring a bell. Oh, it doesn't, doesn't matter. Physical yeah. mapping of memory? Yeah, because I mean, the kernel has like a uh, mapping of the physically loaded uh, memory pages. Uh, so we can basically like access all, all that is like currently in the RAM, you can access from a specific mapping inside Linux kernel. But I don't, I'm not sure if it's available inside VMs. Oh, all, all of yeah. them are, are mapped yeah. as okay. virtual uh, yeah. memory. When it comes to the VM, it only sees guest physical memory. It doesn't see the actual okay. physical RAM that you have in the yeah. in the system. Yeah. And the problem exists, and that's what they solve. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. I had a question about the the register list that you had on 
like slide 16 the, for register pinning. Mm -hmm. um, you, you list a bunch of CR0 and the CR4 things. Um, I was uh, I was kind of expecting like SMAP and SMEP to be in that list. Is, is do you pin those or what? What's the? I didn't. Can, can you repeat your question, please? Um, I'm wondering if uh, the SMAP and SMEP bits in in CR4. CR4? Yes, they, they are they they are protected. Okay, yes. cool. I yeah, just yeah. didn't see the list. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh, I, I think we missed. It. Yeah. Okay. So the, the, the right. SMAP and SMEP are in the li okay. uh, list of bits that are protected. I suspect yes. they would be. I was just like, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. That's CR4. Yes. So, Sorry, yes. that's yeah, my I bad. Just <laughs> yeah. So yeah, it, 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 it is protected. Yes. I think we are out of time, but oh, one more question. Because Keys brought the question of SMEP and SMAP, I remember like uh, Windows based deployments uh, of VSM, they use these x86 features like uh, uh, page table protection using HLAT or uh, uh, to prevent any uh, shellcode execution in user mode with uh, 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 using this uh, MBAC feature. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think they exist in like Linux mainline yet. Uh, is that like uh, still on the? Are there any patches in the mainline to support those features? So we are using MBAC in our solution, where we say that only kernel text has kernel execute permissions, and uh, other like your user mode perm or the other guest pages or other guest memory gets only user mode execute permission. They don't get kernel execute permission. Uh, okay. But uh, when HLAT, like when you have KVM as the hypervisor, what's that? When, let's say, you have KVM as the hypervisor. When we have KVM, that is what Mikhail is working on to implement Heki, where he is, okay. he has actually, as part of Heki, he has introduced MBEC support into KVM. Yeah. And for HLAT, I know that it was also part of our to-do list to yes. um, have support for it. Yeah. 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 Okay. Thank you. Thank you.